The Department of Health and Human Services Inspector General's Office has released its latest report relating to family separations at the southern border. It says top officials at the department ignored repeated warnings from staff about those separations. The report also found the department did not have a plan in place to protect children separated from their families. Joining us with more is CBS News investigative reporter Graham Cates. Good to see you, Graham. So when did staff who care for migrant children first start raising alarms about these separations? Long before, we're talking the early days of the Trump administration. So uh, family separation kind of comes into the public view during the zero tolerance era. That's April and May of 2018. These warnings started in 2017 and they were repeated. You had people saying, I sounded like, I was being told I sounded like a broken record, talking to the top bosses at HHS. And they were told that they were ignored and that they were told not to put their concerns in, war, uh, into, in writing. Hmm. So what were their fears, I guess, about the separations? And uh, what, what did they think would happen to the children um, and the system? They were accurate in what they said, which is that if children are being separated from their families, along with some other policies, this system is going to be stretched to the max. And, and they were saying, we need to prepare for this. If this is going to become official policy, we need more bed space. We need more facilities, more medical equipment, all of the things you, you, you think come with taking care of children. And because their concerns were ignored, none of those actions were taken. And we saw what happened in 2018 and 2019, which was ORR, the Office of Refugee Resettlement, its shelters for kids were, were stretched thin, which meant that children couldn't make it to the, that system, and they were stuck in Border Patrol, which is not meant for the care of children. That meant that the kids didn't get medical services, and ultimately, we saw children die. Hmm. Um, so what were the employees instructed to do when they raised the alarm? Look, they were told to keep quiet. They were told, uh, don't, several people said, we were told not to email about this, not to put this uh, in writing, uh, ostensibly because look, it ends up being in a report when you can, when you can get people's uh, emails because government records have to be kept. And they were told that the, uh, the administration kind of had other concerns. And every time HHS said, we have a red flag about what you're doing with children, the HHS officials felt like the Justice Department and Department of Homeland Security were treating them like they were standing in the way of immigration policy, even though their job and the concerns they were raising wasn't about immigration policy, but about the welfare of children. So do we know how many children are currently in HHS care? The latest numbers are as of December 31st, and that was roughly 4,000. And that shows you what a difference um, this makes. At the height of uh, zero tolerance and some of the other policies discussed in this report, you're talking 16,000 kids in the system. And 4,000, where we're at now, is more along the, uh, the average that you expect over time going back about 20 years. And 16,000 was the most we had ever had. So what is being done to help reunite these families? Uh, at this point, there's a, a complicated legal case that laid out the foundation for what uh, the government has to do to locate families and how the ACLU can help them. And uh, most of the families that were identified um, have been reunited. But here's the thing. Uh, because of all the ignored warning signs, HHS uh, wasn't uh, tracking this very well from the beginning. So we're talking about most of the ones that are identified being uh, reunited. But we never really actually got a firm number. We don't know for sure that we tracked down every last family um, that had a separation. All right. Another story that you're following closely is regarding a U.S. citizen who died in Border Patrol custody a month after reportedly showing signs of distress. He died in custody. What can you tell us about that? Sure. So uh, he died about a month ago. His name was James Paul Markowitz. And this was at a Texas Border Patrol station um, in Brackettville, uh, Texas. And uh, what... We've gotten these really scant details from Border Patrol. They sent out a statement the next day and they gave a notification to Congress that led members of Congress to believe that this man waited for 40 minutes uh, with Border Patrol officials for an ambulance to arrive because he's at this kind of remote station. But in fact, what I learned from looking at police uh, uh, call logs is that the long wait wasn't actually for the ambulance to arrive. It was for them to call the ambulance for him. Roughly 20 to 26 minutes after he showed his initial signs of distress, that's when Border Patrol called the local sheriff, which dispatches the EMS. And then that ambulance arrived within 11 minutes. So 
I, just two days ago, members of Congress sent a letter to the acting Department of Homeland Security secretary saying, we want to know what happened in this case, and we want to know why he waited for 40 minutes for an ambulance and what you were doing during that 40 minutes. And it turns out that during the 26 minutes before they called the ambulance, they, it, DHS just told me in an email, we were trying to provide him with medical care, and then we decided he needed it. And the question that uh, the, uh, sorry, the Con Congressional Hispanic Caucus is asking is, well, first of all, why is it taking us a month to learn that? And, and why are we learning that from a reporter instead of from the Border Patrol as we're supposed to? We just threw up a statement there. Let's throw it back up uh, from Joaquin Castro, uh, because I think it's interesting that he says here uh, that they will hold uh, the CBP and uh, Department of Homeland Security accountable for the deaths on their watch. But I guess my question is, for folks who are just watching this, I mean, the individuals they're at, at, at the end of the day, these things happen not because of some bureaucracy, although initially that is where the directives come from. They happen because of people making, individuals making individual specific decisions. I guess my question is, and you know, are there, is there anybody, is there any one person or any persons being held accountable for the things that you're reporting on? Like, do we hear about that? Uh, no, you know, so every time there's a death in custody, the inspector general for that agency has to examine it. And we know from, from last year when a bunch of children died in Border Patrol custody that that inspector general is looking at those ones. But we haven't gotten uh, reports back on individual cases yet. Uh, and, they, and we haven't been able to see um, who they're faulting, if anyone, right. for those cases. And so in the meantime, it's, it's unlikely that, that, that anyone has been penalized for this or has even kind of been blamed for any of the issues. And I would say it's probably unlikely we're going to find out uh, about specific individual officers that are, that are... And I don't know if that means, you know, that Congress should be looking at ways to be able to verify those things. Because now, as you know, uh, in, in police-involved shootings, you see their, their body cams, people are sh uh, filming on their phones. And so now in 2020, we have a lot more um, uh, evidence to uh, see what is actually happening in neighborhoods and in communities across this country because of the fact that we can verify those things through the use of our mobile phones and through the, uh, the body cams uh, that police officers are wearing. That's just one case where I'm, I'm citing an example of where you know what actually happened because you have that footage. And in this case, we'll never know. We have to rely on the bureaucracy to tell reporters and to tell even Congress what actually happened, and then it becomes murky. And it's actually even harder with Border Patrol. Out of all of the law enforcement agencies that we kind of typically think about, that's local police, the FBI, ICE, Border Patrol really has the least oversight. Mm. Uh, it, it, uh, there are fewer restrictions on, on what they can do, um, and, and until recently, very few people were really paying attention to the law enforcement capability of Border Patrol. That's a great point. Uh, Graham Cates, really important reporting. Thank you for coming by and sharing it with us and sharing it with our audience. Appreciate it.